All right, down to business. You probably have never heard of Adrian Clem. Okay, Adrian Clem. K L E M M. Here's a nice photo of Adrian for you. Uh, you've probably never heard of him, even though he is a former uh, professional football player. And he has this distinction he has not one, not two, but three Super Bowl rings. And didn't take the field for one second of any of them or the playoff games that led up to them you imagine that you make in conversation at dinner I got three Super Bowl rings and unless they ask they think you played (laughs) but he didn't play not one second, not one play, not even a throwaway play like at the end of the game when he played for the Patriots. So when Tom Brady's like taking a knee for victory, not even then, never took the field. And of course, that wasn't his choice. That was Bill Belichick's choice. And the reason that I tell you about Adrian Clem this morning is for this. My fear is that many of us as Christians are headed for a similar fate. Let me explain. We're going to get into Nehemiah in just a bit, but I need to start the series off in Ephesians chapter 2. Okay, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. This little section of verses answers the question, uh, for what purpose were we saved, right? And we get saved, pulled onto team Jesus, right, because he saves us from our sin and from the penalty of sin, brings us back from the brink of death, does all the wonderful work that he does, and we're on Team Jesus now, so we got our jersey and our number and, you know, name on the back of the jersey, woo, Team Jesus, and it's awesome. Uh, This is what God has in mind, right? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, not by works, so that no one can boast, For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus, and here we go, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. To do good works. Um, Every believer has work to do for God. Every believer. He prepared all of that work in advance for us to do before he even called us to himself. He has this set up. Every believer has work to do for God. And here's the thing, every believer also has a battle to fight, right? Don't we have an enemy? Do we have an enemy, right? So we're not only working for God, we're also fighting a spiritual battle and it's happening at the same time. City walls are a big deal. If you are a city without city walls, you are defenseless, completely defenseless to any enemy around you. And back then, lots of enemies around them. This is a big deal. And so here we go. Mark number one, the four marks of people who achieve things for God. People who achieve things for God care enough to know. People who achieve things for God care enough to know. Uh, There's a lot of things that happen in the book of Nehemiah all the way through. And we're going to go through all 13 chapters, man. Even the names, even the list of names. You're like, oh, no. I'm going to look ahead and be sick those weeks. (laughs) Don't do it. They're awesome, okay? We're going to go through the whole thing. There's a lot of things that happen in the book of Nehemiah, but everything that happens, everything that Nehemiah achieves all through the book begins with care. He cared to ask it's not like he's hanging out with Hannah Nee and his brothers and, you know, they're eating some food and kicking back and then the brothers are like, hey, I know your life here is pretty awesome, but our life back there in Jerusalem is kind of terrible. Just wanted you to know. That's not how the conversation goes. How does the conversation go? Who asks? Nehemiah asks because he cares to know. It says, I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile. You see, you and I, we naturally care about the things that are in front of our faces. We naturally care about the stuff that's right in our lives, the stuff that's front and center, the stuff that's loudest. 
I've got this thing going on with my kids. I've got this stuff going on at school. I've got this thing going on at work. And, and maybe at home, I'm working on this thing. And I've got all that stuff. And then my schedule gets filled up with all of those things. And it's like, man, I can't even find room in my head to care about anything else, let alone in my heart to care about anything else. But this is the challenge of the Christian who is called to good works. If we are going to be people who God can raise up to solve problems and get work done in his kingdom, we have to care about what God cares about. And that doesn't happen automatically just because I become a Christian. I've got to train my heart to do this, right? Here's the principle that's true. We know about what we care about. Do we not? We know about what we care about. Those of you who have kids in school, you know their grades? Yes, because you, you know about what you care about. You care to know about that. Uh, what about your retirement fund and how it's performing? We know about that. So we care to know. I, I inform myself and I do this. Uh, what about how to use the latest apps on your phone? We know how to do that. I figure all those things out. I Google things and YouTube things, you know, until the day's done. I know about these things. And let me ask you this, okay? Now, again, I'm, I'm not saying this to shame. I'm saying this to compel us forward to action. Do we know what the offering was here last week? Do we know if it was over or under budget? We might not. We put that information out every single week, by the way, and a weekly update email comes out on Wednesdays. You should be on that email list if you're not. Just letting you know, shameless plug. <laughs> and I will be the first to tell you, as a new lead pastor, I have not been the greatest at getting information out to you, and I apologize for that. So hear me tell you this in this sermon. I'm committing myself to getting better at this. Why? Because I love you all, and I want you to have the chance to know about what's going on in God's work at the church. So meet me halfway, and let's all care enough to know. Let's concern ourselves. Let's ask questions. I don't mind being asked questions. Neither does anybody else in leadership. So we're going to increase the information exchange so that we can do this very thing and be people who God can raise up to solve problems and take this first step. Mark number one, people who achieve things for God care enough to know. Let's keep reading. So Nehemiah gets the news about the gates being burned with fire. And look at what happens in verse four. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept for some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Um, he's pretty bothered by this, all right? So this is where we get our second mark, right? Mark number one, people who achieve things for God care enough to know. Here's mark number two, people who achieve things for God know enough to be concerned. They know enough to be concerned. I want you to note something here in Nehemiah. Has God spoken yet? A lot of times in the Old Testament, when you have these Old Testament figures who like rise up, Isaiah, Jeremiah, even studied last month, Habakkuk, it begins kind of something like this, where they're like, the word of the Lord came to me. I'm like, man, that is awesome. I wish that happened in my life. Except it doesn't happen that much in my life. It hasn't happened yet. But what does tend to happen is what happens here with Nehemiah. God hasn't spoken to him, and yet he has already become convinced that God wants him to do something. That is very interesting to me. And it's because he has become concerned. So he's a follower of God. He's given his heart over to God. And so he is assuming that if I have become concerned about something in God's kingdom, God must want me to act. It's not an assumption that we make right off the cuff. We don't do this, and I think we should take some steps toward it because this is how God gets us off the sidelines. He gives us what I will call a kingdom concern. It's a kingdom concern. 
I think we wait for God to show us a sign that we should jump into service in the church. I think we wait for God to speak to us or we wait to get a phone call or a text message to do something in service to God or to reach out to my neighbor with the gospel. I think we kind of wait for the signs when the sign's already there because God has given us a kingdom concern. Let me explain to you what a kingdom concern is by first explaining what it's not. A kingdom concern is not a preference. I'm concerned about the color of carpet in the hallway. Maybe you are, but that's not what I'm talking about. It's not a kingdom concern. Maybe if you're concerned about the quality of it, how nice it looks, and whether it's updated, all that kind of stuff, but if we're just talking about the difference between red and green, I'm not sure we're talking about a kingdom concern there, okay? But here's a kingdom concern. It's a problem you can clearly see. It's a problem you can clearly see. And because God worked in ancient Israel, he worked with the Israelites back in the Old Covenant, right before Jesus. Now, after Jesus has come and ascended to heaven, we're in the church age. God's working through the church. And so I'm asking, Matt, what are we noticing in the church? Not everyone sees everything. Um, I'll give you some examples. Maybe you noticed uh, man, you know what? I noticed that there's chairs down in kids' ministry, and, and I think they're pretty old, and some of them are kind of cracked, and I might be concerned about our kids sitting on those chairs. Maybe that's a concern. And it might not be the same concern that somebody else in, sitting in your row has about the church, but it's a concern that you have. What about, man, I'm concerned that the toilet paper's out. Huh? I'm concerned that there's not enough nursery staff. When I drop my kid off down there, or when I kind of see what's going on down there, even though I haven't dropped a kid off for a while, I can see that that's the case. Um, I can, you know what? I walked down the hallway the other day, and there's a crack in the drywall. Huh? Eh? There's a ministry that we're not doing right now that maybe I think we should be doing, and uh, these are examples of kingdom concerns. Uh, You know what? We have our neighbors that moved in across the street, and I don't know if they go to church. You feel that in your heart? You're thinking about it? That might be a kingdom concern. It's a problem you can clearly see. What about this? It's a problem you can solve. It's a problem you can solve, right? Because what happens is, like Nehemiah, you will start to see the line that God is drawing between the problem and things like your availability or your ability or your access. You have access to things that other people don't have access to. You have abilities and availabilities that other people don't have. You see how God works this together to bless the church and get things done. This is how God works this. It's a problem you can see. It's a problem you can clearly solve. It's also a problem you can't shake. You can't shake it. You go home, you're thinking about it. You wake up the next day, you're kind of still thinking about it. And it's like, man, I don't know. And uh, I think many of us, and again, I'm not saying this to shame anyone because I'm right with you. I think many of us have this happen in our hearts and we don't automatically assume that God is moving because we haven't heard from God yet. Well, God hadn't spoken to Nehemiah. He'd only given him a kingdom concern. He heard about the walls broken down and the terrible shape that they were in. And he goes, I need to fast and pray and mourn because this is doing something to me and I believe God wants me to do something about it. I think many of us, when we get a kingdom concern, maybe we think I should say something. I should say something to someone so they can take care of that. Let me give you an example of how this could work. Let's take the crack in the drywall. Maybe you're walking down the hallway, you see a crack in the drywall in our building. Does that matter to God? The answer is yes. Matters to God. I think I should say something to somebody, but but maybe you, to rewind it right there, maybe you became concerned about it and you noticed it because you tend to notice these kinds of things. Other people don't. I could have walked by that hallway 400 times and never seen the crack in the drywall. I'm concerned about other things. 
but maybe you noticed that one. And so maybe, maybe it could look like this. Maybe you call up Pastor Dave, not now because he's on sabbatical and he'd be mad at you, but now, and you say, hey, you know what? I noticed that there was a crack in the drywall over here. I've got Tuesday morning available. Could you get me a couple materials? I'll get down there and take care of it. Why? Because God's given me a kingdom concern and I believe he wants me to do something with it. It could look like that. And so we see in Nehemiah a couple of marks. People who achieve things for God care enough to know about what's going on in God's kingdom. And the stuff that they know about, right, Mark number two, they know enough to be concerned. God can use the knowledge to move in their heart to take action And here is Mark number three. People who achieve things for God are concerned enough to pray. They're concerned enough to pray. Maybe you thought I was going to say concerned enough to act. But everyone who fulfills Ephesians 2.10 and lives out the works that God has prepared ahead of time for them to do, knows that absolutely no work gets done in the kingdom of God without prayer. And so we see in Nehemiah's prayer, right? So he's hanging out with his brothers. He gets the news about the wall and he's crushed. He has a kingdom concern. He's like, man, over there, in Jer- over there in Jerusalem, the city walls are in ruins, and I'm in ruins because of this, and I can't sleep, and I can't rest until something is done, and so I'm going to do something, and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pray. So let's read through Nehemiah's prayer, and in his prayer, what we're going to see are a few different things that he prays uh, that are keys for the kinds of prayers that people who achieve things for God pray. Okay, let's begin verse five. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. Okay, he starts with God's ability and not his own. When God's calling your number to get into the game and to do work in the kingdom of God, it can feel awfully daunting because here's what's gonna happen. You're gonna get that move, right? God's gonna give you a kingdom concern and you're gonna think, okay, I think I'm gonna do something about this, I'm gonna pray about it, but then you're gonna get up in the morning, you're gonna look yourself in the mirror and go, I can't do this. I shouldn't be the one doing this. I shouldn't be the one to talk to my neighbor about Jesus. It should be some pastor or something. Somebody who's more qualified than I am. It shouldn't be somebody who's like me. He prays. This is why it's important. You get a kingdom concern, make the first move. Prayer. Prayer. I've got to pray to figure out exactly what God wants me to do and how to do it. And I'm going to start by talking about his power and not my own. Because everything that gets done in the kingdom of God is done by his power, not ours. Amen? Look at what he reminds himself of. We should all start prayers like this. Who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him. God of heaven, a great and awesome God. He reminds himself of God's power and God's love. God's power and God's love. This is his first move. He's feeling like God wants him to go and take action. Time to get in the game, Nehemiah. And I need to remind myself of God's power and God's love. Why? Because I need to know that God's power is with me to do anything he's calling me to do. And secondly, here it is. um, You're not going to do it right, probably. It's going to be fits and starts, and we're going to be, it's going to be like that, and, and I'm going to need the truth of his love to buoy my spirit when I get it wrong, and then i got to try again and make adjustments and do this other thing, and, and you know what? This is just how it works. I need to know that he loves me before I take action because I'm a human being. Look what else he prays, verse 7. We've acted very wickedly towards you, We have not obeyed the commandments, the decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Um, So he starts off praying about God's power. Here's another thing he does in that prayer. He clears his conscience with confession. 
He clears his conscience with confession, and this is incredibly important to do. Okay, a couple of reasons why. Number one, confession's always the best way to approach God. Confession and thanksgiving. Just start with that. You get up in the morning, and I believe this will transform your daily relationship with God. You get up in the morning, you just make your first move confession. All right, time to confess. You think, well, I should confess at the end of the day after I've done some stuff. Well, do it then too, (laughs) but start out in the morning with confession. We've always got something to confess. I always have a sinful state of being. I always say, Lord, I want to do today without you because I'm prideful. Just start with that. Here's what it does. Clears your conscience as you go forward to do things for God. And that's important because here's, here's the real big reason. Because we have an enemy, right? This isn't just work for God. It's also fighting a battle. We have an enemy whose primary strategy against you is to accuse you of sin. That's his primary strategy. You know the number one way that Satan gets Christians all out of the game and on the sidelines is like this. You shouldn't be there. Look at this thing you did in the past. That shouldn't be you. You should get off that stage. Or like this, I'm going to tempt you into sin so then I can accuse you. You see why it's so empower- important to start with God's power and love in this prayer? Clear the conscience through confession. You go through the day saying, all right, whatever Satan throws at you, you can say, I already confessed that, man. <laughs> it's true. I got pride and evil in my heart. I'm desperately wicked, but I already confessed that before the Lord and I've been forgiven. So uh, talk to the hand. I'm moving forward and doing things for God today. We've acted very wickedly toward you, he says. We've not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. And then he says this, remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I've chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Um, Last thing he does in this prayer, he activates the promises of God. Now, that might sound a little strange to you, but let's talk about it like this. Has God made promises? Okay. Are all of his promises going to come true? Okay. Prayer is what activates the promises of God. Prayer gets them moving. And I can't explain to you exactly why, except to say that's the system. We see it in Scripture all over the place. It's just how God wants it. I think it's probably to get us to trust Him more. But this is what He does. He's made us promises. And this is what He's doing. He's saying, hey, remember, remember God, you said this thing. You said that if we got the people back together, turn from our evil ways, that you would gather us back together and make us a nation again. You said you would do that. That's what He's saying to God right now. And you can do the same thing. You're being called into action, getting in the game. Chances are, if he's given you a kingdom concern, you can tie it to a promise in the Bible. Let me show you. Maybe you're being called to do something in the church, something for church, some kind of church work. All right, let me give you one that you can use. Matthew 16, 18. Matthew 16, 18. These are the words of Jesus, so you can take them straight to the bank. When he says, and I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock, here's the promise, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it, okay? So this is a really great opportunity to say, man, how do you do this? Well, tie it to something you're going to do. I'm being called to serve in kids ministry. They say that. We need a lot of help there. Serving in kids ministry and I'm starting, this is my first Sunday, I'm kind of nervous. I'm getting down in prayer and I'm saying, okay, Lord, you promised you would build your church. I'm not entirely sure I know what I'm doing. But I'm standing on that promise and I'm showing up and I'm getting in the game because you're calling my number. And I'm going to go down there and I'm going to trust that what needs to happen is going to happen as we make disciples of our kids as they grow up. Why? Because you promised you'd build the church. Right? It's just what Nehemiah did. Let me show you another one. Right? Concern about evangelism. 
man, I got to share with my neighbor. I'm being called to do this, and, and I don't know exactly how this is going to go. Uh, look at Isaiah 55, 10 through 11. It says that the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Think, Man, I'm kind of nervous stepping into the game, talking to somebody, evangelizing, doing that stuff. Use this promise. God's word will accomplish exactly what he intends for it to. You're sharing the gospel with somebody. Those are planted seeds and God does not waste them. He will do exactly what he intends to do in that person's life. You think, well, I kind of jumbled up my words and, and I'm not sure. Okay, you know, work on those things. But at the same time, it's not riding on you. It rides on the promise of God. So activate it in prayer. God's calling you to get in the game. Use a promise and pray it through. And it gets you confidence moving forward. So Nehemiah has heard the news. He is crushed by the news. He cares enough to know. He knows enough to be concerned. He's concerned enough to pray. And now finally, Mark number four. Nehemiah is prayerful enough to act. Now we get to the action. Nehemiah is prayerful enough to act. Give verse 11. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. Who? He's about to take action. And he knows the first thing he's got to do after he prays, he's got to talk to the king. And he says, so I was cupbearer to the king. Effective work for God is launched from the catapult of consistent prayer. Effective work for God, right? Following through on the works that he's prepared ahead of time for us to do. Effective work for God is launched from the catapult of consistent prayer. And so he's praying and he's praying and he's praying. It's like, when am I going to know when it's time to do something? You'll know because you're praying. You're praying it through and you will know when it's time. Just like he, know, he knew it was time. Man, I got to talk to the king. It's time to take action. When we pray before we act, right? on the concerns that God has given us in our hearts, when we pray before we act, it does a couple of really important things. First off, it fills our hearts with courage. Whatever God has called me to do might seem kind of daunting, but it fills my heart with courage. I want to frame the situation for you just a little bit by asking you this question. Why do you think the Jerusalem walls are in the condition they're in? Is it because the people there are lazy? It's been like that for 100 years or more. Why can't they get this project together? Well, there was an order issued by a king. And the order is recorded in Ezra 4.21. And it says this, Now issue an order to these men to stop work so that this city will not be rebuilt until I so order. Guess which king issued that order? King Artaxerxes, whose cupbearer is Nehemiah. And so in order to go and do anything about the Jerusalem walls, Nehemiah is going to have to convince the king to reverse his own order, which kings were not keen on doing at this time. This is what is ahead of him. This is why he knows I need to take action, my first move, talk to the king and get him to reverse his own order, right? This is absolutely daunting. And so when you pray before you act on the concern that God has given you, he fills your heart with courage because sometimes working for God is very, very hard work. Here's the other thing it does. It shifts our perspective. Lest we think that whatever problem God is calling us to solve is too big for him, I love what Nehemiah says. Right at the end, he says, give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of, and he doesn't say the king, what does he say? 
this man. In prayer, he reminds himself that the king is but a man. This happens in prayer. You get your perspective shifted. You say, no, no, no. Just so you know, you're not talking to this king. You're talking to a man. Remember, you're talking to a man. Serving at church. Hey, you know what? We're just getting the goldfish snacks out for the kids right now, one step at a time. It's going to be okay. Right? Just doing this thing one step at a time. God gives perspective in prayer. And so I can, whatever is daunting ahead of me about the works that he's calling me to do, I can have my perspective set in the right place so that I have the strength and courage to step forward and say, you know what, they're calling my name to, to be in leadership of some kind and I just don't know about this and whatever. Okay, pray it through, pray it through, and then understand that God's going to shift your perspective accordingly. These are the marks of the ones who achieve things for God. And so Nehemiah knows he's got to have a conversation with the king. And that is next week. But I want to leave you with this. I don't want to be Adrian Clem. I don't want to have the bling to show for the fact that I was a Christian, got to heaven, woo, and then when I get there, I have no crowns to lay before the feet of Jesus. I don't want that, and I don't want it for you. So this is a get in the game series. We're going to talk about this a lot because I want you to have some crowns to lay at the feet of Jesus because you did the works that God prepared ahead of time for you to do. He's got things for you to do. He's got things for me to do. And in this series, my prayer is we're going to take some steps toward doing those things. Among a lot of other things in the book of Nehemiah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the truth that you've given us in Scripture today. Lord, I pray that you would help us to take steps to become people who achieve things for you. We do the works that you've prepared ahead of time for us to do. We thank you that you've given us this purpose. In your name we pray. Amen. Happy 4th. See you next week.